thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, let's start where it all started, which means talking about Sydney, but it also means speaking about uh, an iconic work of yours, which I believe we have the great pleasure of having. This is the entree, ladies and gentlemen. The main course <laughs> is here. Remember this one? B barely, yeah, <laughs> actually. The Lockheed Lounge, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> to me, this is a, a pretty remarkable moment because we're in one of the most iconic buildings uh, of the 20th century, now with one of the most uh, iconic pieces of design of the 20th century and with a designer whose name is also iconic. Um, first thing I wanted to ask you is, how did you think about the Lockheed Lounge when you made it? And how do you think about it now? Um, if I start backwards, I, thinking about it now, I mean, it was very weird when it was brought on stage and, and when we started talking about it, it really does feel like another life, you know, when I see that piece. It, I almost uh, look at it, not almost, in fact, in reality, it feels like it was made by somebody else and it feels like it lives a life of its own. Um, and it was really, I mean, I did the first one 25 years ago or something like that. So in, in a sense, yes, it's, it's really from another generation. When I did the thing, uh, I really had no idea what, what, well, I clearly had some idea, but I didn't really think in terms of the future. It was very much of uh, the now. And it was really just carving a lump of, uh, carving a shape out of a lump of foam, because that's how I made the first, the very first one. And I felt a little bit like, um, at the risk of sounding slightly pretentious, a little bit like Michelangelo when he was releasing David from a block of, <laughs> a block of marble. I, I don't mean, it's not so much about the analogy with Michelangelo, it's more about the analogy of releasing something mm. from a solid lump, because I could kind of see it in there, um, and it, it just needed to, to sort of come out. Starting from the beginning also means, as, a, as I said, starting from uh, Sydney. Um, across your career, I mean, if you look at the range of your work, it seems to me there's a kind of uh, a principle of design, a certain style that's enduring and clearly has global appeal. Um, you're allowed to say no to this question, but it, is there anything about your home country or your, or your hometown that you think's been important to your work? I can sort of say yes and no. Um, it's You'll get out alive then, that's good. good yeah, I'm halfway <laughs> there. It's hard, it's hard to verbalize or at least identify what specifically it is about coming from Australia. Suffice to say that for sure it's been enormously influential. Um, and the, um, the influence manifests itself slowly and it becomes evident very slowly. It's only now that I begin to understand what it meant to grow up here. But it, the references are always fairly esoteric, um, and it's always things like, uh, like light, you know, the light that, that you experience in a place like Sydney. The only other place in the world that I've been where you're struck by the light is, is India, you know, when I was in, in Mumbai recently. Um, it's a very hard thing to try and quantify. But the fact that you see a lot of sky, the fact that you're very close to water, and it's not about nature per se, it's just about the kind of proximity to uh, as really essential elements, um, a, a sense of space. And all of these things, in, in a sense, I guess, conspire to give you a very different perception of... of uh, the way things are, are made and the way, the way you use materials and, and, and the processes that you engage and the way that you, ultimately, I guess, the way you formulate ideas. You, you've sort of alluded to it already because as well as, uh, you know, a, a starting place, um, it seems that travel has been very important uh, to your work and thinking. I mean, even when you made a lounge, it's got overtures of travel and uh, movement. Uh, how important has travel been to you in practice? 
And is it something that you think about, you know, kind of in terms of a design philosophy theory? Yeah, on a number of levels, travel is an incredibly relevant part of my, of my life and, and a relevant part of um, my sort of professional practice. And it goes back to the, the, que the previous question, and, and, and to me it seems as if it's, it's really a sort of a national characteristic, I think, of at, at least of younger Australians to travel. And for me, it, you know, because when you, you don't realise that until you do travel and you meet other people of, 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 the, of a similar generation and you realise that travelling for them is really not... They don't think about travel in the same way that we think about travel. You know, for us, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty natural thing to kind of get on a plane or, or get in a car and drive for a long distance, but it's really not, not like that for... For, for a lot of people, um, and it, it, it uh, I think it speaks about sort of inhibition and, and, and the lack of inhibition, that, that, of relative inhibition that you, um, that you experience growing up in Australia. So for me it's a cultural thing actually, and it, and it yeah. I'm interested in people as well. Um, I know uh, your mother's here today. Hi mum, where are you mum? Big round of applause for Mark's mum ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I don't know, your grandfather was very influential as well. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about both that and, I suppose, the work you did in jewellery and with clocks? Well, I, the, I guess that the most important part of that is that I, I went to Sydney College of the Arts in Sydney when it was, well, you would have already gathered that with Sydney College of the Arts. <laughs> <laughs> it's well named. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. It, <laughs> it was in Balmain at the time. And I studied, studied, I mean, I love the idea of studying jewellery. I didn't really study jewellery, I kind of learned how to make jewellery, I guess. And how to become a jeweller and how to become a silversmith. And this was within the sort of context of an art school. So, it, and the reason I did, the, did those things was because they were the, the least esoteric um, um, faculties that you could kind of belong to. You actually, act, you, you know, you really learned how to do stuff. Because in the, uh, in the sculpture department, in the painting department, they really didn't teach you very much. I mean, it was pretty much left up to you. I remember one of my... Because um, I did do sculpture for a while, and, and you were pretty much left to your own devices because they fully acknowledged the fact that you really couldn't teach someone to be an artist. I mean, So I wanted to learn how to do things. I wanted to learn how to make things, not because I wanted to be a jeweller, but because I, you know, I wanted to leave knowing how to, how to do something. And... Nor, nor do I, did I want to be ever a jeweller. But because of the training that I'd had, it was you know, inevitable that, that I would, at some point in my career, sort of lend my hand to, to wanting to make those pieces, those types of pieces. But I think more than that, for me, it was simply a question of scale. And scale's a really big thing in my... Yeah. It's a big word in my vocabulary. It's an important and profound thing for me in, in, in my work. You mentioned the, uh, you know, the, the difference between the, uh, the jewellery department and the, and the sculpture department. Do you think about whether there's a meaningful distinction between artist and designer? Is that a false dichotomy or is it important in any way? I think it's, I think it's, it's an important distinction in the same way that uh, one makes a, def a distinction between a, an architect and an artist, or a fashion designer and a photographer. I mean, they're all different forms of, or different ways of expressing creativity. I mean, design, I think design, design's a relatively young industry, if you compare it to, say, the, the art world or, or the world of architecture. You know, design, I think, as a word, has really only existed, um, you know, was, was coined in the last century. So, so I think it's natural that it's, uh, you know, at, at certain moments in time, particularly more recently, that it's, it's been linked to, to the art world as perhaps a way of trying to give it more credibility. But I think that design within itself uh, is, a, is a distinct industry and it's a, a distinct um, metier, you know, to coin a really useful French word. Yeah. Uh, as well as kind of uh, small runs of iconic uh, things, you, you've worked in businesses of all types. You've designed everything from spaceships to toilets. Um, 
What do you, do you take a different approach at all to something that's designed or intended to be unique, short run, or a very small number of them, and things you know that are going to be mass produced? Yes, in, inevitably, um, there, are, there are all kinds of different approaches, and there are all kinds of different product typologies. There are all kinds of different scales, there are all kinds of different materials, there are all kinds of different technologies that you engage. But at the bottom line, it's, it's all designing. It's all the same problem-solving exercise. It's the same thought process, the same logic that you apply to all of those things, whether it's a toilet or, or the interior of, uh, of an aircraft, or a, or a watch, or, a, um, or whatever, a telephone. So, and that's why I like design, because it, it gives me the ability to cover such a wide range of, of things. You know, people often confront me um, by saying, you know, how, how can you possibly do so many different things? And for me, it's kind of the same thing, really. It's just different scales, different materials, different processes, but it's the same thought process. As, as Jess mentioned at the outset, uh, your name has become a brand and is a kind of hallmark of, of quality. Um, really? Can you give us, <laughs> on a good day, um, well. can you um, speculate on any differences between Mark Newson the brand and Mark Newson the person? Well, you know, I, I don't think of myself in terms of a brand. I, I guess... <laughs> it would be weird to us. It would be weird, yeah. <laughs> How's the brand looking this morning? Yeah, <laughs> I know. Or I haven't, I, let, let, let me put it a different way, yeah. Um, I, I haven't thought about the, so much, I haven't thought about the, the, the kind of, uh, the ramifications, the consequences of, of, of having a brand. I mean, you know, I just kind of, it, it sounds really naive, but I just do what I do, you know, it's, it's my job, this is, this, is, this is what I do. I really honestly don't know what else I would do. If I couldn't do this, I'd be screwed. So... It's turned out quite well, though, hasn't it, really? It's, it's okay. <laughs> It's okay, yeah. As you do uh, all those, um, that, that great variety and scale of things, and I, I suppose it's interesting to think about, you know, an iconic work like this that in some ways will be timeless um, and live beyond you. Are there kind of, do you start thinking about what a legacy you want to leave in terms of your work and does that influence choices that you make about each next project? It doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't influence me in a, conscious, in a conscious way, but I always strive, and I think I always have, even from the moment that I did that, to, um, to create something that would be able, in a sense, to live its own life, to live by itself. And I guess, you know, again, at the risk of sounding slightly pretentious, to, to, to strive to create a classic. Whatever a classic is, I'm not quite sure, but I guess ultimately it's, it's, at least it's something that, that, that has the ability to out, outlive you. But I think as a designer, um, I, I think designers should be obsessed and should be preoccupied with the idea of designing objects that can stand the test of time. You know, I'm not really interested in the concept of disposability. I think perhaps one of the indicators of something that's become a classic is if two people from the Powerhouse Museum have to walk it on with rubber gloves, which is definitely what happened with the, the Lockheed Lounge. Um, and let's have a big round of applause for Paul and Ross, who bought the Lockheed Lounge on, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and this lounge does actually live at the Powerhouse Museum, and it doesn't get out much. It might be a bit lonely, so do go and visit, because uh, obviously it's uh, a work which was born here in, in, in Sydney and has kind of influenced the, the world. Uh, Mark, it's been a great pleasure speaking with you. It's been fantastic to have you here as part of TEDx. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Newsom. Thank you.